active forces in the Western Desert are now in full retreat. This episode is brought to you fortified by the highest quality tea experience, made with the military precision of tactical tea. The British Army has a long affiliation with tea, keeping the Tommy going. This is Guy Byam reporting from Normandy in 1944. There are signs up. Perhaps the most common is the phrase that always brings a smile to the faces of the troops. It's a phrase that will be quite incomprehensible to anyone but a Britisher. You see it everywhere. When in doubt, brew up. Well... When you brew up next, why not consider a nice cup of Blitz Brew from Tactical Tea? It's a traditional English breakfast tea, strong and robust, a throwback to the blends of the 1940s. Tactical Tea offer a wide variety of teas, white, black, fruit and herbal. So, to requisition your supply of Blitz Brew, go to tacticaltea.uk and use the code WW2PODCAST for 10% off your order. Tactical Tea, waging war on bad brews. Hello and welcome to another episode of the World War II Podcast. I'm Angus Wallace. I recently read David Colley's The Folly of Generals. David analyses some of the missed opportunities the Allies had in 1944-45 in Europe. He argues that had Eisenhower been more adept at taking advantage of several potential breakthroughs in the Siegfried Line in the autumn of 1944, the war in Europe might have ended sooner. It was such a fascinating read, I thought I'd get David onto the podcast to examine Eisenhower's broad front policy. Now, this podcast is brought to you by listeners like yourself who enjoy the show and help me find the time to put it together by becoming patrons. By committing to pay a dollar or two each month via Patreon. You can find out more at patreon.com slash podcast. If Patreon is not your thing for whatever reason and you would like to join the gang, you can go to www.podcast.com forward slash support and you'll find information on how to support the show via PayPal. In doing so, if you check the box to be added to the mailing list, I'll send you links to extras as and when I have them. So that's www.podcast.com forward slash support. David, thanks for joining me. Um, So we're going to be looking primarily at the post D-Day period and uh, Eisenhower and how he was pursuing his broad front policy. It's probably a good starting point to lay out what this was, as it's probably the uh, starting point to understand the decisions that are subsequently made? That's an interesting question. I know that uh, prior to D-Day, uh, uh, the Allies, I guess you would call it Shafe, Supreme Allied uh, Command, uh, drew up a plan on how they would progress through France, from, from the beaches through France into uh, Germany. The uh, plan called for reaching the Seine River probably by the end of September and uh, reaching the German border by May 1945. I I, I don't know precisely whether that was to be everybody moving at once, uh, all the divisions, uh, because uh, certainly after the the breakout at Normandy, uh, uh, Patton and even Montgomery went racing towards the German border. And I think at that time, the broad front kind of fell apart uh, because Montgomery wanted to get as far north as he could and Patton wanted to get into uh, Germany. But I think once that was stopped, then the broad front uh, aspect came into full play. Uh, after the war, General Beadle Smith, who was uh, Eisenhower's uh, chief of staff, pointed out that they had diverged very little from the original uh, D-Day plan. Uh, and he was proud of that. Uh, basically saying the the broad front basically won the war. Uh, So I think what happened is that once the Allies got to the German border, Eisenhower in particular didn't didn't want to take a a chance and allow any particular army to uh, uh, go too far and possibly get cut off. One of the things they point out, whether it's true or not, is that he was haunted by Kasserine Pass. 
in North Africa, where the American First Division was really kind of pummeled by uh, uh, Rommel. So he was always concerned about that. He didn't want that to happen again. So he stayed pretty much uh, with this broad front strategy. And whenever a a division or a a general had the opportunity or the possible opportunity to break through, Eisenhower and Schaaf didn't want to permit it. And this is particularly true uh, in uh, Devers. General Devers was the commander of the Sixth Army Group, which was the American Seventh Army and the First French Army. They reached the Rhine in uh, November 1944 uh, and were prepared and actually were moving uh, troops and supplies to the river to cross. They had it all worked out, a plan. Uh, They controlled the Rhine around Strasbourg. The opposite side of the Rhine was uh, poorly defended, if not defended at all. And uh, so they were actually moving when Eisenhower appeared at uh, 6th Army Group headquarters in Vittel, France and ordered the uh, advance to stop. He wanted all the troops moving in tandem. He didn't want a loose cannon across the Rhine. Devers' proposal was to cross the Rhine, come in behind the German First Army, uh, north of Strasbourg, which was blocking Patton's Third Army. And if that had happened, uh, the assumption is, or at least Devers' assumption was, that the German First Army would have to retreat uh, and thereby uh, the whole German front line might collapse. So that was that's the, to me the biggest example of where Eisenhower and the Schaaf continued this broad front strategy. Now, uh, Montgomery was very much opposed to that, as you know. So to a certain extent, Montgomery's philosophy, if you want to call it that, was correct. I think the, the American criticism of, of Montgomery was that it took so much time for him to, to move. Everything had to be in place. Uh, He was not a general who would jump uh, for an opportunity that exposed itself uh, because the Germans were masters. Uh, If they saw a breakthrough, they were able to close that uh, breakthrough up. When I talk about Wallendorf, uh, the British were moving north through Brussels and the Americans were moving through Luxembourg and the American Fifth Corps uh, reached the German border at Wallendorf and along that area there, from Wallendorf down to uh, Echternach and north, I guess, uh, I'm not sure exactly where, maybe Wilts. They were ordered to make a reconnaissance in force across the river. And they literally waded across the river and there was there were no Germans there. They continued and they pushed that advance uh, 10 miles into Germany towards Bitburg. Uh The Germans naturally responded violently. But the interesting thing is the Germans at that point were so depleted that they they could only call on basically non-infantry units, uh, many of them. Uh, they had clerks and uh, cooks thrown into the into battle. And they were, you know, the Germans had a way of just pummeling whatever came in, but they didn't have much defense. You know, if you had broken through that defensive line, there was nothing there. And so the Americans got within 10 miles, got 10 miles into Germany and were called back, mainly because of this uh, German response. But the German generals after the war said, you know, if you'd had a division to reinforce this breakthrough, you would have gotten to the Rhine and there was nothing to stop. My contention is that the Allies had tremendous reserves. Germans didn't have those reserves. They had to pull troops from the Eastern Front or they had to go pick up, uh, you know, stomach battalion guys, guys with ulcers and everything, and throw them into the line. And, uh, generally, you know, as one American said, you did, a teenager can sit in a pillbox with a rifle and hold up a battalion for a whole day. So it, you didn't need a lot of, of experience to do that. But uh, had the Americans persevered more, uh, they probably would have uh, been able to break through in uh, September. This is September, early September. And the, this was the same week that the Allies launched Market Guard. Now, market Guard's interesting because you were talking about broad front and then you've suddenly got this almost non-broad front break with policy as a, a, you know, and as a plodding Montgomery, as you sort of alluded to, suddenly decides to put a rocket up his backside and try and shoot through uh, Holland. Now, you're quite, you're quite critical of uh, Market Garden. Well, yes. Uh, and I think even some of the higher British officers were too. There was... Uh, there was a general, uh, there was a major, uh, they both had the same name, can't remember it right now, 
uh, the, the major just died. He lived in New York and worked for the UN. He was very much opposed to uh, uh, this operation. And he was the one that was told to take leave because he was uh, uh, under too much stress. Uh, I'm tr- tr- trying to remember the name of that general. Urquhart? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, there was a general with that name, and then there was a major, or a captain, and he was uh, head of uh, uh, counterintelligence or intelligence for one of the airborne divisions. He later, after the war, uh, was working for the UN and was just died uh, maybe this year or last year. Anyway, he was opposed to it. Some of the American generals couldn't believe it. Gavin, for example, uh, listening to a uh, proposal or they were given uh, instructions by the British and Gavin turned to his uh, one of his uh, cohorts and said, uh, I can't believe what they're saying because the they were prepared to drop the British Airborne Division six or seven miles from their target. And Gavin said, you can't do that. And it turned out to be true. And it was very poorly organized, which is interesting from the standpoint of Montgomery. If he'd had the time, probably would have uh, squared that away. But my point is that you have a breakthrough at Wallendorf uh, in Aachen area at the same time. The Americans advanced about 10 miles through the Siegfried line. Wallendorf, they broke through the Siegfried line. Aachen, they broke, broke through the Siegfried Line. They were seven to eight, nine miles into Germany. It, it was stalemated. The Germans uh, threw in a, a reserve division. I think that came from the east and blocked the Americans. But still, uh, again, the German generals after the war said, you know, if you guys had just reinforced your troops, there was nothing to stop you. And here you have Market Garden in the same week, 100,000 men plus, uh, third British Corps, I would estimate about uh, 40,000 paratroopers, at least five airborne divisions sitting in Britain. You had two or three American divisions in Brittany, holding the, making sure the Germans didn't break out of the ports. You had two infantry division, American infantry divisions uh, along the Loire uh, as protection for the Third Army. You had thousands of possible troops to throw into some kind of breakthrough. And uh, they could have done it. They did it in the Battle of the Bulge. The airborne divisions were dropped in within um, uh, 24 hours. And so it could have been done. And you take all those resources that went into Market Garden, it was a failure, uh, if they had taken just a tenth of those resources and put them towards a breakthrough, uh, Wallendorf or Aachen or Strasbourg, uh, they might I'm not saying they would have, but I'm just saying they might have been able to break through to the Rhine and that, you know, then they would have moved on from then. The Germans were in tatters. They didn't have much to uh, to stop, but they were they were brilliant in their uh, in their in their defense. I read book after book. Uh, you reach this, you know, you get, they talk about Wallendorf. Well, you couldn't the Americans couldn't have gotten through anyway. That's that what they say. They didn't have the supply. But that's not true. The uh, Fifth Armored Division that broke through, uh, that was used, was used in the breakthrough uh, at Wallendorf, had uh, spent two days in Luxembourg uh, getting gas and artillery and resupplying uh, and then moved to uh, the border and then moved into Germany. So they were relatively well supplied. One of the other areas that I speak of is Belford in Alsace, where General Trescott, American General Trescott, who is considered possibly uh, one of the best, if not the best, American general of the war. But he didn't have the publicity because he was mostly in Italy. He wanted to break, to get to Belfort. Americans were coming up through southern France. Uh, They breached uh, Alsace or the border of Alsace within a couple of weeks, maybe a month or so. And German 19th Army was in complete disarray. uh, Trescott said, we make a move. We're going to move to t- capture Belfort in the Belfort Gap and, and prevent the German 19th Army from retreating into Alsace and then into Germany. He was turned down, uh, again, probably by Schaeff and Eisenhower. And the uh, interesting thing about it is, and this is when I say folly of historians, uh, Trescott realized that they had limited supplies, but he said, if, if we want to do it, we'll do it. And it's that important. And the histories that you read are, oh, well, you know, Trescott was, it was uh, pie, you know, blue skying. He couldn't have made it. They didn't have the supplies. And 
Of course, no one will ever know. But if you're a general and you have the opportunity to cut off an entire German army, you know, go for it. Truscott thought that it was possible. And as it stands, what, it, what happened was that the, the uh, Sixth Corps, his, so he was Sixth Corps, instead of breaking through to Belfort, they were sidelined up uh, along the western edge of the Vosges Mountains and then directed to fight in through the Vosges Mountains into Alsace. Whereas if they'd gone through the Belfort Gap, they would have been they would have bypassed many of those mountains. So it's a I, I just I got really tired of reading. Uh, you know, I've written a number of books. I've written about six books on World War Two, and I got tired of reading about having uh, historians or somebody writing about it saying, well, it was impossible anyway. And without going deeper into, you know, what the situation may have been. That was one of the motivating factors. You know, read about Wallenhoff. Well, they couldn't have done it anyway. Or Aachen, they couldn't have done it anyway. And Belfort, they couldn't have done it. Or Strasbourg, you know, you had an entire army group crossing the Rhine. Well, they, you know, they, were, they wouldn't have been able to supply it. Well, they had figured that out. So I just got tired of reading about how these it was impossible and, and no one had ever carried it, you know, a little, at least beyond speculation and, you know, re- reviewed the fact that there were you know, five airborne divisions in, in Britain, in Great Britain, unused. And one of the motivating factors behind our market garden that may have handcuffed shape was that Eisenhower was getting a great deal of pressure from the American uh, high ranking generals in Washington to make use of the airborne divisions. And as the Allies moved across France, the airborne divisions were were notified to get ready for action. They never got into action because the, the ground forces reached the, the objective. They were uh, itching to get into action. And with this pressure from Washington to use make use of the airborne divisions may have had a, a major factor in, in, uh, in accepting a uh, market garden. Beetle Smith went to, to Montgomery uh, just before market garden and said, you need another division Airborne division, you can't drop the British first airborne division that far away. You need some supplementary troops. And Montgomery turned them down. A lot of this may have resulted from the pressure from higher up to get something done, anything. It almost worked. I also, I, it struck me that uh, there's a, a perception uh, that you've got to have the big battle. You've got to have the big win that will finish the war. And all these little actions that actually might have made a big difference are not big wins. But but if you if you filtered all these little bits together, you, they would make a massive difference. Where often if you try, yeah, the, the analogy that struck me when I was thinking about it is this idea from the First World War of bite and hold, which proves successful, but it doesn't give you a a, a big headline win you know people try for the som for the big win and it doesn't work and that's almost you know, we'll go for market garden it's a big and it's the same with plunder you know when you're plunders in uh when in march 45 huge set piece battle yet if uh Davis had got across in november that's months and months and months and months and months before but it's not a big win it's a bite and hold action which would actually potentially have made much more difference uh, you know s- sooner but now you mentioned plunder and, and, and something very interesting there. At the same time of plunder or just before plunder, the Americans uh, captured the uh, uh, Morgan Bridge and started sending troops across. And there was the uh, bridgehead, the Morgan Bridgehead. Now, I, it's hard for me to believe this, but I have read a number of occasions that Eisenhower ordered First Army. They were told not to advance more than a thousand yards until plunder took off because they didn't want to uh, upstage Montgomery. And this is another factor that's very interesting, and that is that Eisenhower, one of the things that Eisenhower was good at was politics, holding the alliance together. And he didn't want Montgomery and the British to feel as though they were being manhandled by the Americans. So he tried to balance this whole thing all along. And did a pretty good job of it. I mean, ultimately, everybody knew the war was going to, to be over. Uh, the Allies would win. The question is when. And my point was that if you can end it five or six months earlier, you're going to save a lot of lives. I think the, the total number of American casualties was somewhere around 70,000, 80,000 
Americans were wounded or killed in that period of time. Uh, well, if you add the Battle of the Bulge in there, uh, Americans suffered 80,000 casualties uh, from then on. Uh, so you probably Americans suffered uh, 100,000, 150,000 casualties in the late fall of uh, 1944 and then into 1945. We're talking about that balancing act, uh, the political balancing act that um, Eisenhower did, did, does even, sorry. You've got the liberation of Paris. Now, you're quite critical of the liberation of pa- Paris, but presumably that's also another political decision rather than necessarily a military decision on Eisenhower's part? Yeah, well, the plan was to uh, to go around Paris. Certainly, General Bradley was very much opposed to, to uh, taking Paris. And his, his uh, point was, look, if there's people are starving for the last uh, year or so, they can starve for another couple of days or a couple of weeks, and they're not all going to die. And so let's go around Paris, go, get to the border. We'll come back and deal with Paris later on. Uh, of course, now, uh, General de Gaulle said we've got to take Paris, and he sent uh, Leclerc off, hightailing into Paris. And then the question was, if, if the Germans decide to fight, uh, it's going to be a bloodbath. So that kind of forced the Allies, I think more Americans, because the British were farther uh, along the coast, to uh, move into Paris. The amount of tonnage, supply tonnage, that was then devoted to Paris never made it to the front lines. And uh, whether that had a, a significant impact, I don't know. But you certainly are l- losing some of your resources to take care of Paris rather than pursue the enemy. So that was a factor. Again, no one knows whether it would ever had a different outcome or not. But I, I suspect that it did. Certainly Pat Patton was very concerned that the, the, the amount of supply going to Paris affected his army. But Patton, I think, was one that could complain a lot. Patton was always obsessed with supplies and felt he should have more, more, more. <laughs> right. Well, what, you know, again, what is not pointed out, he kept saying, well, if you give me supplies, I can break through. But the Germans were per- perfectly aware of, of Patton's reputation, and they were loading that front, making sure that that was well uh, reinforced to protect against Patton. And I think uh, after a certain amount of time, the the, uh, the number of forces on the German side were almost equal to the number of forces on the American side, where in that Patton, in Patton's realm. Yeah, he was always complaining. It's, uh, it's interesting because he's always a complaint. It's, it, it, gas is usually what comes up, but I suspect that there must be, ev- it must be everything. But Patton always seemed to be able to pull supplies out when he needed them that's the other thing he never had enough but then he never seemed to have a problem when they asked him to do something in a hurry he could yeah well this magic it out of thin air this is an area that i touch on and i think it requires a a great deal of of research in-depth research and what i pointed out is you know you always hear well if Patton had had gas he would have been able to get through maybe but you read some of the statistics i think you're talking the absence of gas was in the last couple of days of August. And then supplies started to, to come in a bit. So I'm not sure whether, in fact, he was had that didn't have that much gas by the you know, he captured, according to him, a million gallons of of German gasoline. And that figure is pared down to one hundred and fifty gallons. Bradley, in his memoir, says a million gallons. Uh, Patton, in his, his uh, paper, says a million gallons. A million gallons would take him for a couple of days, certainly if he allocated it properly. By the first week in September, the Third Army was actually starting to get more and more gas. And by the middle of the, of the month, that was, they were back to normal. It would be interesting if you could find the statistics, real statistics, on how much gas Patton was getting. In reality, not what something says here or something says there. You know, Patton's kind of an enigma anyway. I, I think he's overblown as a as a commander. Uh, he never was really uh, fighting the best of the German army. He was in North Africa and he commanded the Second Corps only for about three weeks uh, before he was transferred to uh, Seventh Army to invade. You know, in preparation to invade um, Sicily. And in Sicily, his Seventh Army moved through the island, uh, through the center of the island, virtually against no opposition. And uh, the British Canadians were fighting on the main force of Germans going up the east coast, I guess it was. 
So he didn't wasn't really uh, tested there. He had great ideas, uh, military ideas that the, that I think the American army uh, should have been able to adopt. The American army was pretty much behind in that. And in France, he didn't take over Third Army until I think the end of July, after several weeks or more of really serious fighting between the Allies and the, the German army. And the German army was at the breaking point. And he took over pretty much at the time when the German army in Normandy was on its last legs. So he could chase a bunch of uh, broken spirited, broken down Germans across France. And he gets, you know, Montgomery advanced just as fast up the coast. And First Army was advancing almost as fast, if not as fast. So he gets a lot of credit. Uh, he was a, a great character, a great figure, and draw the, the publicity. But the question is, how really was he ever confronted with, you know, really, I mean, if he'd been on the Eastern Front fighting the best of the Germans, it would have been a different story. Well, I think he, get, he has these blind spots, doesn't he, Pat? And, and he gets stuck at Metz, doesn't he? And it's a typical, yeah. it becomes a slogging match. And, and you look, it's easy to look back and go, well, why didn't you just bypass it or do something different? But he, he you know, and, and I think you point out that he actually, with Bradley, he was uh, in favour of tying up 80,000 troops to take the, to the Brittany ports, which again, you know, it, it, it's kind of all thinking, what, what, how about just boxing these people in and moving on and keeping the momentum going? You know, that's two examples of Patton not actually keeping his momentum going, which is, which is his unique selling point that everyone likes to think he's doing, driving forwards. But he has his blind spots, just like Montgomery's, you know, he's not necessarily a, a driving uh, general. You know, Market Garden is kind of... Uh, not something that he excels in, that kind of thing. He's a big set piece and he comes un unstuck with it. Yeah. You know, but. Well, it's always interesting to, you know, compare the training or the experiences of, of both sides. The British having experienced the, the slaughter of World War I uh, and how that affected their strategy. And, of course, there's a lot of uh, talk that it did. Uh, Montgomery didn't want to uh, send troops in by the, you know, have them cut down by the thousands. And the American army was such a small army uh, really, their training, except for the Civil War, uh, was chasing um, Indians and Mexican bandits. And <clears throat> so <clears throat> frequently you hear the German army saying uh, about Patton, uh, you know, Patton saved their, their rear end numerous times because he didn't follow through. And the German ar Germans would frequently, a number of generals would say, you know, the American army doesn't know how to concentrate, you know, and force their way in uh, through the, into a, some kind of a victory. And so you had the American army, I think by the end of the war, the American army had, lear had learned quite a bit and was adopting uh, a number of the German methods of war. But, you, you know, you combine an Indian fighting force with Montgomery's concern about too many casualties, and you may not want to take too many chances that's a factor. So it's interesting, you know, to compare the two. I mean, it's there's a lot about World War II that has never been explored, you know. And you start, you know, you study Patton. I talked to him. I'm working on a uh, something right now uh, about counterintelligence during the war. And I spoke a number of years ago to a, a fellow who uh, was in Sixth Army Group counterintelligence, and he had been in North Africa, and he had experienced Patton. And he said the man was, was crazy. He said he was the worst type of commander you could possibly, you know, he would scream and yell at people and uh, just put on a performance that was, you know, childish. So studying Patton, you take away the veneer of Patton. Now, who was this guy? And was he really that great a commander? There's some of the American commanders who were uh, virtually unknown. One of them was P. Wood. Uh, he was a, uh, in command of the 4th Armored Division, who was really uh, a very uh, successful commander. He was sent home, uh, and I'm never quite sure why. I think he was a very emotional guy, and he was just kind of uh, at the end of his rope. But they could have rehabilitated him and given him some rest and sent him back. He, he did a very good job uh, as a tank commander. And then there's Trescott. Eisenhower wanted Trescott to be part of the uh, Allied armies invading France. He'd been in Italy with the uh, 3rd Division and then the 6th Corps and the 6th Corps. And before 6th Corps invaded the south of France, Eisenhower asked Devers to uh, release Trescott to be a corps commander, possibly even an army commander in France. 
uh, northern France at the D-Day invasion. Devers realized how good Trescott was and refused to release him. So that really soured the, rela- the relationship between Devers and Eisenhower. But, you know, Trescott doesn't get the credit uh, because he wasn't uh, in the uh, news the way the uh, army commanders were in, in northern France. So a lot of this is, it, you know, you could study this war for, for generations <laughs> and that people will. People have. <laughs> <laughs> Keep shuffling it about, but it you know it, it's an interesting point that we you know that, that invariably people actually uh, study it at a, a micro level, just looking at a single uh, operation or engagement, or they look at a grand strategy, and then actually if you start when you start tying the two together, and you say, well, the problem with the broad front strategy is it prevents that kind of those single operations sometimes meaning something because they can't be exploited, and heavens. The Germans knew how to exploit those, you know, the fall of France seems to have almost been accidental at exploiting uh, one weakness after the other. And suddenly they're, they're, they're winning, which is, I don't know, do you think the broad front policy essentially prevented the Allies taking any of those risks and actually exploiting a fast win? Oh, yeah. There's no question about it. I mean, I, you, you take a look at Devers' attempt to cross the Rhine at Strasbourg, uh, they would have been north of Strasbourg. They would have crossed at a, at a town called Rastatt, uh, which was a kind of a con- transportation center. Uh, there was nobody. There were no Germans on the other side. The, the other side of the river was the Black Forest. You know, one of the criticisms about Devers' policy there was, well, if you cross the river, you got the Black Forest uh, and, uh, you know, you, there's no defense. Well, whoever, if the Germans had to come through the, the uh, Black Forest, they would have had just as much of a problem as the Americans defending anyway but nevertheless they sent americans were sending uh, patrols across the rhine and they would see these pillboxes that were empty so devers decided with patch general uh, patch who was the seventh army commander uh, who was experienced because he'd been in the pacific at guadalcanal they decided that you know this was the way they wanted to go and, and they they had expressed this intent for several weeks or months that once they reached the rhine they would cross it and eisenhower had specific instructions to all his generals when you, you know, the objective is to reach the Rhine and cross and create a bridgehead so that they would use in the future. Devers is following this policy, and uh, he was probably a couple of hours away from uh, actually conducting this operation when Eisenhower shot it down. The other aspect of this is uh, Eisenhower and Devers didn't get along, but Eisenhower had this kind of old boy network there Bradley, Collins. He had to keep all of these guys happy. And Devers was off in the south of France somewhere. And Devers was kind of a kind of a what I would call a, a kind of an old school guy, uh, prim and proper, m- much more so than Eisenhower. I mean, Eisenhower had some pretty salty language. Devers once uh, when he was in command and before the war uh, commanded uh, Patton and Patton was you know prone to using salty language. And so a newspaper came in and interviewed Patton and uh, he was using all kinds of, you know, salty words, probably not as bad as today. Devers dressed him down and said, well, you can't we're not going to you can't run that article because you're using language that uh, would would uh, uh, embarrass, you know, the, the mothers of the soldiers on this base. So he was kind of a straight arrow. Eisenhower was prone to salty language. You know, Eisenhower was a very good athlete. Uh, you know, could bang heads, that kind of thing. He wanted to make sure that his his commanders, not Devers, because Devers was out of the picture. They, these were the guys. Patton and Bradley were the guys who were going to cross the Rhine and get the uh, the accolade, not Devers. And Devers could very well have done it. And and, and it's funny that uh, I think is it Patton Patton gets across the Rhine as well before Monty, doesn't he? I think I think it's, the Americans get across. In, in two places, literally the, the, the days. I think it was Remagen a week before or something, and it sort of kept... Yeah, it was about that, but it wasn't Patton. It was, uh, it was, uh, but Patton's over somewhere else, I think, the night before. He even makes a push and manages to yeah. get across somewhere. Yeah, but the Remagen Bridge <laughs> was a couple of days or a week or so before yeah. plunder, and that was First Army. And then Patton, I think, a couple of days later, crossed the Rhine. and uh, crosses as well. All just trying to... Stick two fingers up to Monty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Every one of these guys is fascinating. You know, the 
Montgomery you know, personality is, you know, I don't think he was particularly well liked by the Americans. And um, they used to make fun of him. And I don't know how he how he was rated by the, the British, but, uh, you know, his I think some of his staff members thought he was a little way out. But, uh, you know, he was revered by the British, the British public. Well, he was a winner. He was seen as a winner. I think afterwards, if anything, people tend to think he's a bit of a he's just he, 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 he was a difficult character to get on with. He's he was he caused a lot of problems for people with his wasp. He's waspish. He was, you know, he would dress people down without any reason or unjustified it he would be he's very difficult to get on with the with the americans american you know, quite understandably he just seemed to insult people uh it wasn't very diplomatic um and I'd, you know but you couldn't fire him because he he, he won at el alamein and it was our big victory yeah but i think i think <clears throat> over time if you think about what the american the american strategy and the british strategy i think ultimately uh, at least I've come to the conclusion that Montgomery's strategy was the the appropriate strategy. Uh, if if he had been more bold, instead of taking time to line up his ducks, just barge ahead. Because you know the, his his idea of the of the uh, single shot or whatever you want to call it was correct. Although you know I think Eisenhower also criticized him from the standpoint if you have a uh, if you go too far you're going to get cut off. Uh, but I think he had, he was the one that wanted to push instead of broad front, make a major thrust and you push your way right into Germany. And I think it was correct. And unfortunately, Market Garden, had it been a little more thought through, would have been the end. Just, uh, just a bit more luck. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, that, uh, it's, you know, these discussions are going to go on for, for decades. <laughs> Then you've got where did Mark Gag go wrong? What was the X factor? Uh, you know, is it thirty core not being able to get with the road, or uh, is it Gavin not taking the bridge, or oh, what was the bridge too far from the from the drop zone? You can you can keep listing them and ticking them off and rearranging them them to see what the uh, what the decisive decisive factor was. Uh, 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 anyway, we should possibly leave that for another day. <laughs> Thank you, David. I think as I said at the start, I I really enjoyed your book. Folks, if you're interested in reading David's book, it is The Folly of Generals, How Eisenhower's Broad Front Strategy Lengthened World War II. I will put a link on the website. That is all from me for now. Next time we'll be looking at 